Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am your host, John DeLynn. It is March 24th, 2021, and we have a short Mormon Stories Podcast episode today. And when I say short, I mean an hour to hour and a half at the most. Might be shorter, um, but we have, uh, we have something important and interesting to talk about. Uh, recently, uh, a, a news story started splashing across uh, all the Utah newspapers. And when I say all the Utah newspapers, I mean two Utah newspapers, the Deseret News and the Salt Lake Tribune. Uh, we'll, go, we'll go with the uh, Salt Lake Tribune first. Fair Mormon adopts a new name and urges a kinder approach in defending the LDS church. Um, and of course, uh, um, in uh, the Desert News, the headline is Fair Mormon Drops Mormon from Name and Bickering from Posts. And uh, those of you who have been following Mormon Stories podcast over the past six to eight months will be very familiar with the backstory, which is really interesting. And I'll just recount it really quickly. Um, at some point a few years ago, Kwaku uh, L., um, uh, a convert to the Mormon church, an actor, and a high, a BYU student, and a hired act, uh, apologist, along with Cardin Ellis, uh, also kind of a hired gun, wannabe actor, podcaster, producer, and then a guy named Bradley Whitback. At, Whitback. at some point, uh, a year or two ago, they approached Fair Mormon, the Mormon apologetic group, and said, hey, your videos stink. We think you need to create a new set of videos that are hip, that are cool, that are funny, that are even sarcastic, that are edgy, and that are kind of like Saturday Night Live, where there's young hip people sitting at a desk uh, reporting on news, telling jokes, but also doing apologetics, but apologetics with a twist, with an edge, with humor, um, etc. cetera. And uh, they made this pitch to the, the Fair Mormon board, um, my sister, Julianne Hatton was on the board at the time that, that, that pitch was made and, uh, fair Mormon deliberated, uh, as I understand it, and they approved this project and they even got funding for it. Our understanding is that either through the Mormon church or one of its subsidiaries or the more good foundation, uh, money was actually funneled from the Mormon church and, or through its rich donors through uh, the More Good Foundation to Fair Mormon so that Brad and Kwaku and Cardin could purchase equipment and could be paid to launch these hip, cool, cutting edge videos. Let's just say a dozen or so of these videos were made um, and their primary target was, uh, I guess, primary uh, addressing Mormon, tr tr uh, Mormon church truth claims, but Jeremy Runnels and the CES letter were very much uh, in the targets because Jeremy Runnels and the CES letter have been so successful uh, in, in, Mor in Mormonism, in waking up Mormons to problems with the church's historical and or truth claims. And I was sort of also a target uh, with a lot of the efforts with Kwaku and Cardin and Bradley Whitbeck. Um, and so when these videos were released, I'm going to say last fall, winter, um, it caused this huge uproar. And, uh, um, you know, the biggest uproar, I don't think they made it, they really registered much in Mormonism, uh, Orthodox Mormonism writ large, but they certainly registered seismically in the ex-Mormon community. And we had this huge reaction uh, basically with, with people, um, saying that these were unchristlike, these were mean spirited, these were really shoddy, bad apologetics. Um, you know, we, we had people saying that they were deceptive, that they looked bad, that they weren't that funny. Uh, we had all sorts of, uh, opinions being expressed. And we also had a lot of response videos made by Zelf on the Shelf, by um, by Nemo on YouTube, which is um, which, which which is Douglas. We'll, we'll be having uh, him on in just a second, and we just had a lot of reactions on Reddit, 
and it was a real controversy. And it culminated with, I'm just going to say, a prediction on my part. I made a prediction that, uh, you know, I, I said, I hereby predict three things regarding the new Kwaku Fair Mormon videos. Number one, that they will cause more people to leave the church, the Mormon church, then they will keep in the church, um, primarily because they're uh, um, unchristlike and uh, they're just mean spirited and ineffective. Um, secondly, I predicted that the videos would be taken down. And third, I predicted that they would cause more damage to fair Mormons already struggling uh, reputation. And I beseeched all of my listeners to share these videos as much as possible. Um, in addition to these fair Mormon videos with the equipment, with the donations, with the money that Kwaku, Cardin, and Bradley Whitbeck received, uh, Kwaku and Cardin in parallel uh, also simultaneously launched podcasts. So Kwaku launched the Stone 16 uh, podcast channel on YouTube and Cardin Ellis launched the Midnight Mormons uh, YouTube channel um, as well, where it was like gloves off. We're coming after John DeLynn. We're coming after Jeremy Runnels. Um, you know, they, this, this is where they made these claims that Jeremy and I were home wrecking for profit, that we were, you know, horrible human beings, that we were just intentionally trying to destroy families, um, for money. And it, it, it again caused this huge reaction to the point where I felt like I had to create an entire episode of Mormon stories podcast, which is one of the most widely viewed Mormon stories podcast episodes in years where I, where I exposed the more good foundation, the donors behind the more good foundation, fair Mormon, you know, uh, book of Mormon central, uh, you know, Daniel Peterson, uh, you know, um, just, just all of these sort of like arm's length subsidiaries of the Mormon church, nonprofits, all receiving direct money from the church and all of them doing the church's bidding, but in a way that would allow plausible deniability. And we even exposed the, the financials of uh, Book of Mormon Central, um, you know, the interpreter, Daniel Peterson's organization and the Morgood Foundation showing their uh, nonprofit financials along with naming their donors and we knew that it was just going to be a matter of time before a lot of this house of cards came crumbling down and it did you know to their credit it took a few months but just this week you know we had these uh, the desert news and the Salt Lake tribune report that not only was fair mormon changing its name from fair mormon to fair latter-day saints but also as we expected would happen, as we even, yea, dare I say, prophesied would happen, the Quaku, Cardin Ellis, uh, Bradley Whitbeck videos were taken down off of YouTube and FAIR has now promised a kinder, gentler, no more ad hominem, no more mean-spirited attacks approach. Uh, and and I, I just think this is good on every level. And I just wanna start by saying, Congratulations, John Lynch. Congratulations, Scott Gordon. Congratulations, Mormon Church, for doing the right thing. Um, ad hominem is always bad. It's bad if I do it. It's bad if Fair Mormon does it. It's bad if Daniel Peterson does it. We need more love and kindness, both in Mormon apologetics and in ex-Mormonism. We need more love. We need more compassion. We need more kindness. So uh, I, I want to begin this episode by saying congratulations fair mormon congratulations mormon church good job taking these videos down was the right thing to do you did the right thing you should be congratulated i commend you for it and i am committing to look harder at what i do and to try and be less less mean-spirited less uh less critical less negative less personal attacks more focus on the substance and on um the positive kind of stuff uh that that should be that we all should be focusing on um anyway that's kind of the introduction to today's episode and what i just wanted to do was to bring back two people um that have kind of been uh involved in uh this um 
in this situation, I'm bringing back Anthony um, Miller, bringing him back to Mormon stories again. He was on some previous episodes talking about the future of Mormon apologetics and, and neo-apologetics. And, and of course, I also uh, wanted to bring on as well uh, someone who I've had on, on Mormon Stories podcast before, Douglas Stilgo, who goes by Nemo on his YouTube channel, which is a, a rising uh, important voice within the Mormon YouTube world. He's also joining us from the UK, and we love his voice as well. So, Anthony, let's start with you. Welcome back to Mormon Stories Podcast. And just tell us really quickly in, in a minute or less who you are and uh, what it is that you kind of what, what what your kind of your involvement is in the Mormon conversation. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me back. Um, I'm Anthony Miller. I live in Billings, Montana. Um, I'm almost uh, five years away from uh, a fateful weekend where I stumbled across the Gospel to Topics essays when I was searching for resources to support our adult son when he came out to us as gay, which led to an acute existential faith crisis. Um, over these last about five years, I've interacted with you in a faith transition workshop. I participated in the Sunstone Symposium. I've participated in several podcast episodes, including uh, sharing my own story uh, back in August of 2019. Um, I created and co-lead a, a local Mormon sp Spectrum support group. And uh, in any event, I strive to be thoughtful in what I do. Um, I blog at unpackingambiguity.com. I'm uh, working on a book. And uh, it's been delayed until next year, but I'll be giving a TEDx talk uh, in March of 2022. Uh, about thriving uh, and building community after a Mormon faith crisis. All right. Well, it's so great to have you, Anthony. Everyone loves your voice. Um, and Douglas or Nemo, uh, welcome back to Mormon Stories podcast. And tell us tell us a bit about you and, and what you've been doing lately. Yeah, so uh, my name is Douglas. Uh, you can find my previous Mormon Stories uh, episode where I talked to John about the faith crisis I went through uh, around this time last year. Uh, around the time of the Quaker videos, I started a YouTube channel, Nemo the Mormon, where I began by fact-checking those videos. And my intent was to have a response that was the complete opposite of those videos in terms of its candor and its tone to have a response that was measured and polite and equally not afraid to just confront the issues in the church. And I seek to do that now. I seek to do that um, with the active members around me. I seek to do it online uh, through my YouTube channel. I'm speaking at the UK Sunstone Conference uh, this coming weekend um, about a slightly different issue. But generally, I just aim to be a measured voice in the conversation. Uh, and I'm, like I said, for the UK, I'm very grateful to be here. All right. Well, it's great to have you both. And uh, so let's begin um, by by kind of each of your re reactions to this announcement. I want to hear, I, and Douglas, I should probably give you credit. Uh, I, I have been having pro kind of problems sleeping over the past several years. And so I'm almost always up by four or five in the morning. And it was just this weird coincidence that the morning that I actually slept until 8 a.m., uh, which is a freak accident for me, uh, this this stuff kind of broke, along with the James Huntsman story as well, which is notable, which is my my friend James Huntsman, son of John Huntsman Sr., brother of John Huntsman Jr., uh, just announced with the Washington Post that he has started a lawsuit to sue the Mormon church for fraud in federal court. But anyway, Douglas, I want to, I, I, one of the reasons I brought you on in addition to your brilliance and your eloquence is that you, I, you were the first to break this story and you were the first to let me know about it. So why don't you start by just sharing with us your, your reactions uh, to okay. when, how you found out about it, what your reactions were. Sure. So, uh, so like I said, I started my YouTube channel with these videos and um, my YouTube channel just recently hit a thousand subscribers, which is a, kind of really exciting moment for me. And I thought, what better way to to celebrate that that small milestone than to 
go back to my roots and, and fact check one of those videos that I didn't get a chance to at the time. So the video I picked was the, the CS letter and temples. Um, and I downloaded it as I normally do onto my computer and started loading it up. Um, wrote my script, wrote my video, released it on Sunday morning, your time, Sunday evening, my time. And uh, the Monday morning, uh, so late Sunday evening for, for yourselves, I was checking over my video and I always post the link to the video that I've looked at in, um, in the description. So I was checking over the links and lo and behold, the video has been set to private. So I think, what's going on here? And then I go on the Fair Morgan page and uh, those videos are no longer there. And so I, I messaged John. I was like, John, you won't believe it. The Fair Mormon videos with Quaker and Brad and, and Garden, they're gone. And uh, it's three in the morning, John's time. And he's like, oh, okay. And we start chatting about it. And I said, well, he needs to go to sleep. Uh, but we, <laughs> we have this we have this conversation about it. I was like, yeah, we need to we need to sort this out. So I put a couple of posts up. John shared those posts around. And, and it's kind of been in the zeitgeist since that point. Um, I guess I should share that I yeah. I did sleep until eight, but only after I had woken up at three and, and corresponded with you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we had this conversation um, and the initial knee jerk reaction when something like this happens is to go, oh, well, they're hiding stuff, you know. But but our conversation was was quite candid in saying, well, this is this can be viewed as a positive step. And, uh, and that is reflected in the introduction that John gave earlier is that actually we can look at this as a step forward beyond the knee jerk reaction of all oh, see they're hiding stuff again. So that's kind of where I kind of came into this. Um, that's how my involvement has been uh, with these videos and with this story kind of breaking. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Anthony, how did you hear about it? And, and uh, what, what were some of your initial reactions? Um, so I, uh, when I woke up, uh, that morning and had my morning coffee, I opened up Facebook and there was, uh, there was your post. And then we started, a, a joint shared, uh, message discussion about maybe having this discussion today is how I ran into it. Um, so my feelings about it are, are mixed. Um, I absolutely agree that this is a positive step forward. Um, I figured that they were not going to keep fair Mormon forever because Mormon is an epithet supposedly now. Um, the name you mean? The name Mormon. Yeah. yeah. So I figured that they were going to change the name. Um, and when we talked about uh, the future of apologetics and so forth and, and the experience of creative destruction and trying them, try, people being truly believers, trying to make sense of this exodus uh, or loss of, of belief in the church, um, you know, that they would try a lot of different things and it would be messy. Um, and so I think it is absolutely a good step forward to publicly come out and say they're not going to do, you know, the personal ad hominem type of attacks and uh, that they would take down um, these things. At the, at the same time, um, there's something that I've experienced uh, in some Facebook groups where they have rules that the rule is you're not allowed to delete your comments or the rule is that you're not allowed to delete a thread that you started, even if you figure it out that it was a problem. And the reason for that in some of these groups is that individuals put a, sometimes a tremendous amount of emotional investment into responding to difficult, you know, paradigms, patriarchy, other kinds of things. And when those types of threads get deleted, they, they're not only deleting the problematic information, but they're also deleting all the uh, work and the emo emotional and otherwise investment that people put into responding to that problem. And, and I understand that there's, there's that too. So um, my view is what they did is a good thing. Uh, their change of approach is a good thing. Um, I think they probably did some surveys uh, and came to the realization that these videos were counterproductive, that a large percentage of the views were coming from the ex-Mormon community, um, that uh, 
a lot of people were being newly introduced to the CES letter who had never read it before. And because these videos make it sound like the CES letter is easily debunked, more people read the CES letter uh, than did before. Jeremy's indicated there's been a huge boom of new downloads of the CES letter since those videos. And they came to the realization that it was just really counterproductive. So that's my range of thoughts on, on their choice to take it down and do the change. Okay, so the, there's a lot to unpack or at least to kind of dissect. Um, you know, one of the things that was really surprising to me about this is, um, well, well, first of all, I mean, what, one thing I didn't mention is that, you know, as I mentioned previously, and as we covered pretty extensively, what, when, when all of this erupted, you know, Kwaku and Cardin created those violent videos that, or, or, or reshared those violent videos. We don't know who made them on Twitter that had me being beaten over the head with a, with a bat, Jeremy, you know, on the sidelines waiting to be beaten, just very violent videos that caused me to call the FBI and report card and Jeremy too, to call the FBI threats of violence, all the Desnat stuff. Um, and, and obviously that was a kind of a, a, a match that lit or that started the explosion. Um, you know, that, that's something that I didn't mention and those videos are still available as well. That obviously complicated things and really up to the ante um, uh, in all this. But, but a couple things that were interesting as, as that kind of died down, one thing that was interesting to me was that you, we kind of, okay, the immediate reaction was Scott Gordon and John Lynch, and we've shared this before, but uh, as, as this started erupting, people started, re even faithful Mormons, friends of mine who were very, almost celebrities, global celebrities, people whose names you would mention, re people whose names you would recognize, told me that they reached out to Scott Gordon and John Lynch and complained. So, so, so John Lynch and Scott Gordon start getting this, this flood of emails, complaining phone calls, and then their responses were doubling down. So all these people that communicated with John Lynch and Scott Gordon started sharing with me, and I'm assuming you guys and Jeremy Runnels, Scott and John Lynch's responses, which were not, oh my gosh, maybe we made a mistake. Oh my gosh, you know, maybe we did a bad thing. It was Scott and John saying, no way, like it, it, you know, we've got, we're losing the youth. We've got to keep the youth. The only way we're going to keep the youth is to do edgy hip stuff. We made the right decision. These videos aren't going anywhere. And, and there was kind of this doubling down along with Scott and John Lynch also doubling down on the hate speech towards me and, and Jeremy calling me an evil person. Uh, you know, saying that I'm destroying families for money and, and same types of accusations against Jeremy. So, so when I saw th those responses from Scott and John, I'm like, oh my gosh, these guys are doubling down. This isn't going to change. You, you guys, you guys remember those responses, right? Let me have you start, uh, Douglas, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I remember, I remember reading one of those responses saying, "No, no, we're 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 getting good feedback from the from the young people of the church," and I thought, "No way! I I am one of the young people of the church, and I know people in the teenage kind of age bracket. And these videos, if they think these videos are are good for the youth, that's kind of insulting to the youth in a lot of ways." Um, so I, I remember reading that and just thinking, "No, that's that's not going to work. It if if those are the people you're targeting." This, this doesn't appeal to them. It, it just won't work. Yeah. And I, I remember looking at the view counts of these videos mm. and knowing that they were being shared on ExMormon Reddit. And like you said, Anthony, even though the view counts were higher than the regular Fair Mormon video view counts, um, they, if you factored out the, the ExMormon Reddit exposure, I just was not buying that a lot of Orthodox Mormons and even Orthodox Mormon youth were, were watching these videos. A Anthony, what's your, what's your thought on this question about the, the doubling down of Scott Gordon and John Lynch and the success of the videos? Well, I think, I think they trusted 
um, what Kwaku and the others were telling them that this was going to give us a high view count and that this was going to give the youth of the church uh, some reasons to not go read the CES letter or, or explore it at all. And I, I think, I think Gordon and and the, and the others were kind of sold on that. Um, I I would say that there are so many good things that actually came out of this. Like this was these videos were a contributing factor to Jeremy reaching out to Jim Bennett and Brian Hoglid and going through the process so that Jim Bennett could confirm who the CES director was that the original letter was written to. Um, and, and Brian uh, Hoglid could as well. Um, I don't know if this is the only reason. I don't think it's the only reason, but it's certainly a contributing reason to Jim Bennett doing uh, his interview that he did with you, John, that I think was uh, a, a very important con contribution to the Mormon Stories platform uh, for people. And um, for, for those who are interested, uh, you should know that uh, Jeremy has kind of awakened his work, and he did a response to the debunking that John is sharing here. Um, and uh, there's a lot of really great content on this. So I would encourage you, hopefully we'll leave the links in the show notes, uh, so that all of you can go and look through and see what Jeremy's response was to these videos, uh, as well as different links and and uh, a video a movie that Kwaku wrote the screenplay and uh, and starred in. Uh, there's a link to that there too. Um, so there's all sorts of really th good things I think that came out of this. Um, anyway, that's my take. Yeah, yeah, I've, I'm sharing it right now. Um, the so yes, that that's part of the uh, part of the title of this interview. And you're you're introducing the topic now, Anthony, which is that Fair Mormon uh, awoke a, a sleeping giant. Jeremy Runnels never wanted to do the CES letter for fame or celebrity or money. He did it, delivered it, and then moved on. He retired, and he moved on. And even though it, its success has been legendary, um, Jeremy was done. And he, you know, we we've always been in contact. And Jeremy's like, John, I don't know how you do it. I, I'm not interested in being in the limelight. I, I want to just raise my family and live a quiet life. And and Jeremy was happily retired. And and unfortunately to Fair Mormons and the Mormon Church's chagrin, this Quaku Cardinalis Bradley Whitbeck Fair Mormon John Lynch Scott Gordon campaign awoke a sleeping giant. And if you guys go to csletter.org slash debunkings slash fair mormon dash fair dash tits and please forgive the the acronym but that's the acronym that that quaku and cardin uh got uh fair mormon to buy into this is the show acronym tits jeremy has spent the last several months doing what jeremy does which is digging into um you know these attacks and so you can see here on the screen that Jeremy's got uh, a synopsis of what happened. He's got a, a synopsis of who the founders are, little bios on Quaku and Cardin and and Bradley, uh, you know, describing in detail who they are and what their background is. And uh, he then goes in to talk about Fair Mormon's low standard of apologetics. Um, you know, the death threats that we received, uh, supported by and retweeted by and encouraged by Cardin and Kwaku, um, that we had to report to the FBI. He goes into, in detail, debunk their debunkings, um, responding to their allegations that Jeremy never, you know, this is one of the things Cardin Ellis, one of the claims Cardin Ellis made, which was that Jeremy never actually met with the CES director at all, that Jeremy had made up this entire thing, which Jeremy is is going to, and it has thoroughly debunked. They go into the LDS church, how they fund Fair Mormon and a conclusion. And, and Jeremy also now is finishing a book on what's next for progressive and post-Mormons, and he's writing a biography, and he's willing to re-engage in ex-Mormonism. So 
the giant has, you know, the sleeping bear, the giant has been unleashed. And I just encourage all of you to go to CS letter slash debunking slash fair Mormon dash fair dash tits and review this content and share it with the world and donate to csletter.org, donate to Jeremy because he has spent literally thousands of hours on this stuff, getting paid almost nothing. If you, and he talks about this allegation that Jeremy's just in it for the money. And if you add up all the hours that Jeremy has donated to this project, he's been paid like less than 10 bucks an hour. Uh, I, I'm gonna guess, I don't have the exact number, but it's ridiculous, these allegations that Jeremy's in it for the money. Even I, who am, I think, fairly compensated now after 13, 14 years of doing this, uh, I'm not in it for the money because I just need the money to be able to do it. If I didn't have the money, it wouldn't be worth the death threats and the slander and all the allegations I'm receiving on a weekly basis. So yes, I'm paid, but I don't do it for the money. Jeremy is barely paid and he for sure isn't doing it for the money. And just, I'm so thrilled that Jeremy is, you know, it's sort of like Hulk has rejoined the Avengers. You know what I'm saying? And I'm I'm super glad to have Jeremy as a, as a as a fellow compadre for at least as long as he can. Okay, so back to kind of the story. So Scott Gordon and John Lynch were doubling down. They were saying we're not going anywhere. We 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 are uh, you know we back this campaign 100. percent We're having all the success, like you said, Douglas. That was kind of unbelievable and a little bit insulting to Gen Z Mormons. But you know that's that's that was their. Um, you know, line and they were sticking to it. One thing I noticed is that, you know, r even, even Rick, um, even Jim Bennett told me when he did his interviews, he's like, Cardinalis is having me out uh, to, you know, he's having me on his show, Midnight Mormons soon. And I had heard that Kate Kelly had done an interview with Midnight Mormons, that they were going to try and do a slander job on me, calling me a you know, painting me as the next Harvey Weinstein. That's something Kate Kelly's been trying to do ever since the Harvey Weinstein thing broke, you know, because, you know, because one thing's for sure is if you, if you, if you speak truth to power of a high demand religion, that's hurting people, the religion is going to pay people to, to smear you and fellow ex religionists are also going to try and smear you. And if you talk to Leah Remini or, um, you know, Jehovah's Witness, ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, ex-Scientologists, ex-Orthodox Jews, you get smeared by e either side um, when you speak truth to power. It's just what happens. Anyway, it seemed like um, Cardin and Quaker were going to be using these Fair Mormon videos to launch Stone 16 and Midnight Mormons. And what was interesting to me is the Jim Bennett interview didn't, didn't appear and the Kate Kelly interview didn't appear on uh, didn't appear on Midnight Mormons. Now I've been told by a source that those videos still exist, and uh, I don't know if Jim did the interview, but the Kate Kelly interview still exists. It may be released at some point. I don't know, um, but 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 what what's undeniable is that it's kind of like Stone Sixteen, and especially Midnight Mormons and Quaku and Cardin kind of went silent. So Douglas, what, what did you have? Did you notice that? And did you have any thoughts about it? Then in Andrew, I want to ask you the same question. Yeah, I, um, Anthony, I, not Andrew, Anthony, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I was carrying on kind of fact checking the videos. I did it over a series of weeks and I realized they started to kind of, there was less hubbub, less talk about them. Um, no more videos were getting produced. It seemed like they'd reached the end of their run. Um, and so I, it, it had started a fire in me to kind of continue commentating the way I did. And so I carried on looking at just the regular church's material and um, other apologists, like uh, Saints of Scripted, things like that. Um, but nothing of that ilk had come about again, kind of coming into the new year, uh, not that I identified. And so in my mind, it was very much an incident, an episode that was was done and dusted. And so I, I had... I had archived a moment in time in which I had responded and in which this incident had happened, but that it was, you know, that maybe they were just going to quietly slink away and just let them fade. Because what I did see was an increase in the number of uploads on Fair Mormon's channel, almost seemingly to bury these videos down. You right. know, just just loads of old lectures from from you know years back that were just being posted on Egyptology and Kerry Mulstein and things like that. They're all being put up quite 
quite precipitously whereas before you had uh they, they weren't posting quite so regularly uh you'd have kind of month-long gaps at times and things but then all of a sudden it was just bam 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 videos almost just to try and push these down their channel's page yeah absolutely um that that was really interesting and in my my conspiratorial mind i'm like let's see you know church church leaders probably didn't like the um, viol the, the talks about violence. They didn't like the negative backlash. They didn't like being associated with mean spiritedness. And because we called out donors, because we showed the money trail from the church all the way to these fair Mormon videos, it just had to be, it had to have been at a minimum that the church reached out to fair Mormon and said, you guys got to kill this thing. I know that a lot of, I know that donors like to be, don't like to be exposed. So I'm guessing donors got really upset that their names were being brought into this mm -hmm. arena. And, and I'm guessing that a lot of fair Mormon supporters or Orthodox Mormons just complained and complained and complained. And Scott Gordon and John Lynch just were told you guys got about you guys got to chill out and backtrack and and bury this hmm. anthony do you, do you have any theories or speculation on what what may have happened i mean my my theory is that uh initially they were excited because they had high view counts but at some point they either did some surveys uh whether it's anecdotal surveys or they had someone actually do some surveys to find out what the effects of the videos were and and they found out that it wasn't having the effect that they thought it was having i mean that's what i think is probably the most reasonable explanation for what happened is uh just through a scientific method of doing surveys and asking people they found out that it was wrong but i would agree that that uh, donors, uh, uh, influential members of the church probably gave negative feedback um, uh, to the videos as well. Certainly, um, there were some concerns going on. You know, I read that Kwaku's fine for his uh, young and dumb uh, COVID dance parties, right? COVID dance parties. I, I read somewhere that they're fine is maybe somewhere in the ten thousand dollar range uh for what they did um and and i've interacted with kwaku and my understanding is that um his dance parties and other stuff projects that he's working on are so busy and consuming that that you know if, if i'm believing what he's telling me that that's a contributor to why he hasn't continued producing a lot of content uh, similar to these, but, um, so Quaku gave you the impression that he's, he's got such a burgeoning party business that he doesn't have as much time for apologetics as he used to. Yeah. Par yeah. Party and other projects. He wasn't really that specific. You know, uh, when these came out, I messaged him and asked him if he had done any sort of public statement about the videos, uh, going private. And he said that he hadn't and that he's just really busy with other things. You know, maybe they'll figure out how they could adjust these videos, you know, maybe in the fall or something so that they meet the new uh, protocols for FAIR. Um, but that he's so busy with other opportunities that it's not a priority to him at this point. Just a, yeah. Go ahead, just a quick ahead, point, John. Yeah. Um, there was some immediate backlash um and some immediate kind of shifting uh, i remember that because m the thumbnails i use are essentially the thumbnail of the video that i'm fact checking with a bit of my own branding on um and in trying to find a thumbnail for the first video that i fact checked mo wives mo problems um that had seemingly disappeared very quickly um i've since found it archived in the internet and so it's back up but what it was originally was a picture of I believe Jason Derulo or someone of that of that sort of um, celebrity, surrounded by scantily clad women, um, and what they'd done is they'd superimposed Brigham Young's face on it um, as kind of a joke about polygamy, and that did not last long at all. That was uh, very quickly taken uh, down and taken out the picture. And what what does that mean to you, Douglas? Uh, that means that straight away someone had had said to them, "That's not appropriate, guys. That's that's not on." And I, I think. 
knowing that that happened that quickly, I think it was only then a matter of time that someone's going to say, you know, the whole tone of this is just is not on. Because if 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 straight away they've been given that free reign to do something and then they make a mistake like that, they're going to be like, oh, okay, oh, I'm not sure we're comfortable with this. I think that will have started those conversations pretty early on. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so they were silent for a couple months, like the church always does. Uh, they, they don't ever respond immediately to critics because then it would create the perception that revelation comes from the bottom up instead of from the top down. So the church waits a few months. Um, we don't hear a lot from Fair Mormon. Like you said, Douglas, Fair Mormon starts stuffing its YouTube channel with old videos, pushing down. Um, pushing down the Quaku videos so that they're far, far, far down the feed. And then of course, now we, we hear the announcement. And so here's a view of the announcement. Um, the announcement, first, first of all, the, the website now, instead of fair Mormon is fair Latter-day saints.org. And of course we expected that because Russell M. Nelson has decreed that, uh, using the term Mormon is a victory for Satan. And so we were always wondering why the church's leading apologetic arm is still using a word that is a victory for Satan. So we all anticipated this name change. We just wondered, frankly, why it took so long and what name they were going to choose. And, um, um, and, and the article, uh, at the fair Latter-day Saints.org website because now it's called fair latter-day saints instead of fair mormon and now fair stands for faithful answers informed response there's no more w use of the word apologetic and they make their announcement about the name change etc um that came i think it came a, like a day before the quaker videos were taken down um anthony let's start with you on this one what was your reaction to this press release by by fair latter-day saints what did you think about it what were the high points or the interesting points for you yeah i mean so the organization that was at byu when when it got restructured uh to the maxwell institute from and, farms right yeah when farms got restructured to the maxwell institute um, and they kind of got rid, uh, Daniel Peterson was no longer in charge of that. Um, and I think it was Gregory Smith, isn't that, that who wrote the, the hit piece on you Yep. and others, they, uh, weren't necessarily involved with that organization anymore. And, and so for the board, for the Maxwell Institute, I understand that there's at least one member of the Quorum of the 12 on the board. Um, certainly members of the Quorum of the Twelve are on the board of BYU, um, that I think that the leaders of the church weren't comfortable with that kind of personal attack, ad hominem, kind of really harsh approach. And we saw that happen at BYU from Farms to Maxwell Institute. Um, I'm wondering, in this case, if there's a similar dynamic, even though FAIR isn't part of BYU, because the church um, does uh, partially, at least directly or indirectly fund. And, and Jeremy shares a video uh, from uh, one of uh, Fair Mormon's conferences where uh, one of the General Authority 70s uh, expresses very specifically that the church supports Fair Mormon. And uh, so everybody should watch that little snip that he does. I, I would think that the higher up leaders of the church are uncomfortable. If they were uncomfortable with it at Maxwell at Farms, which became Maxwell Institute, then eventually they would become uncomfortable with it at Fair Mormon. Um, and so I, I, I suspect that there's probably a similar dynamic. Um, you know, my question is if that eventually makes its way to uh, the interpreter, uh, you know, in other places where uh, apologetics is uh, has a tone of personal attacks and aggressiveness and things like that, too. I wonder if it'll go beyond Fair Mormon. I mean, this really is the, the legacy of, of Hugh Nibley. You know, B.H. Roberts was an apologist, but you never got the sense that he was attacking the critics. But Hugh Nibley kind of kicked off this 
multi-decade era of ad hominem smearing and attacking uh, the the critics, and that's what Scientology does. They call it fair gaming. And I had Mike Rinder on recently, and, and it's basically almost like for decades, Fair Mormon, you know, Daniel Peterson, Lou Midgley, Greg, Greg Smith, and others have just been taking pages out of the Scientology playbook. And I've been fair gamed by the Mormon church for years, smeared lies about me, attempts at hurting and attacking me. Same with Jeremy, same with others. Um, and, and, you know, of course we've been covering over the past 10 years, the Mormon church's move from ad hominem old school apologetics, a la Daniel Peterson and Hugh Nibley to what we've called pastoral neo-apologetics, a la Patrick Mason, Spencer Flume, and Richard Bushman, Terrell Givens, which is this nicer, kinder pastoral apologetics that focuses on love, that doesn't attract, uh, doesn't attack critics, that even ignores critics, and then attempts to just focus on uh, healing and growing, which I think, you know, we've got concerns with, but we're also simultaneously applauding it as a step in the right direction. I guess what I was wondering is if this rep, you know, we've been, we've been bashing on old school apologetics now for decades. Um, and, and now fair Mormon has taken apologetics out of its name. And it has also basically said, we're, we're not going to do that arguing attack style stuff anymore. Um, you know, does this represent the death of Hugh Nibley's old school Daniel Peterson, you know, brass knuckles apologetics? What, what do you think, Douglas? I, I hope so, uh, but at the same time, kind of not uh, for selfish reasons. Um, because what I do essentially is, is, is a lot of what I do is point that out to people that this is what's going on. And, um, and you know, it's it, it's it's one of the things that's helped me really know where to put myself is that I don't want to be that. Um, and so I as, think, as yeah, we're Mormon. You mean as an ex as, as, as well, yeah, as someone that's still trying to interact with the church from a, from a, a very difficult position, a position that's been painted with ad hominem attacks for years. Um, but I think we're starting to see that shift. I think we're starting to see that, that go as people are becoming more compassionate and understanding towards just generally those that think differently. Um, in terms of faith, uh, you know, in in Britain here, we've had firesides where people are free just to bring their questions about the gospel topics essays and come and talk about the difficult things. So you know, we're getting um, a lot more open conversation, at least over here. Uh, I know there was there was a particularly charged emotional kind of atmosphere in the states at the time of these videos coming out around the the kind of presidential election. Everyone was fired up over there. It seems. Um, but as that's kind of calmed down, I think hopefully we're stepping forward into a new place of kind of listening to one another a bit more, uh, particularly in the church. And hopefully this is this is hopefully fair Mormon, not just listening to those leaves of the church that have told them they need to calm down, they need to step back. Um, as we've heard Elder Oaks saying to uh, the gem membership of the church generally when he said we should accept losses uh, politically graciously and we should you know be kind and, and these sorts of things and there's no place for violence and such um but i think they're also hopefully listening to people like me and people that are commenting on what i do and and people that are commenting on those of us on this side of the fence as it were they're listening to us and hearing that rational voices are having a good conversation and maybe they've decided they want to join in on that rather than just throwing epithets and and being mean yeah. Hopefully. Anthony, Anthony, what do you think? Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, you you shared today uh, on on Facebook and maybe on Twitter too that the most recent uh, church magazine for uh, the month of April, it's the Leah Hona, it used to be the Enzyme, um, has quite a few articles with regard to interacting with people who have lost belief. There's an article an anonymous article about uh, being in a mixed faith marriage. And I haven't read all of those articles, but I did read the one about, uh, there's one about what if your brother left or something like that, and there's a mixed faith marriage one. And and they, they were pretty good articles. They were very conciliatory, very supportive. You know, I think it's the kind of material that, that we would see from a Jackson Washburn or a Jim Bennett or a you know, a Givens or, or one of the Givens or, or Patrick Mason and so forth. 
And, and so that's hopeful to see that kind of thing show up, uh, maybe not 100%, but it, it's, it's becoming more prevalent, it seems, uh, in, in, the, in the church with those articles in the church's magazine and, and with this change uh, with FAIR. So maybe it's helpful. You know, I don't know what the, the details, you know, are if there's been very much research. But when, we, when you have a couple and one of the spouses goes through a faith transition, the likelihood that the other spouse will eventually go through some degree of faith transition, uh, if the marriage stays, if they stay married, is probably pretty high. You know, I don't know if it's 80, 90% or higher. Um, and um, when you have not probably not very many families in the church that have gone untouched uh, during these last during this last decade, where they have a close friend or a family member or a spouse or a kid ha having gone through some sort of faith transition, you know, th this is becoming more prevalent. And, and so um, I think there's probably a greater recognition that the kind of personal attacks and ad hominem and really aggressiveness is not helpful to retaining relationships in, in families and in marriages. And I think, you know, if, they, if the church has done some studies where they, they've done broader based studies with emails, like the stuff that uh, Pe Peggy and uh, Jana, I think has both have recently written about, uh, with regard to asking members about how they feel about youth, about how they feel about the LGBTQ community and, and their experiences in the church. I think that they're recognizing that the healthier way is, is this direction. And I think that's a good thing. I think that will be helpful. It's a super good thing. One of the, so one of the part, part of my title today, other than sort of, you know, uh, Jeremy Runnels unleashes, you know, awaking the sleeping giant was that fair Mormon partially repents. And I meant kind of two things by that. One is, you know, just like the Mormon church, Dallin H. Oaks basically are on record as saying we neither seek nor offer apologies. Fair Mormon offered no apology to me or to Jeremy, which, which again is just so, um, head scratching because they're acknowledging that these were mean spirited and they're saying, that they don't want to uh, do uh, cr critical ad hominem attacks anymore, but they're not actually apologizing to me and Jeremy and others who they smeared. Um, so that's 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 why I called it partially apologizes. I would appreciate that apology. I would appreciate them living up to the the teachings of of Christ like repentance that that the church teaches. And then secondly. Um, you know, we don't know whether the church is just going to find some way to creatively hire or pay under the table or foster new types of smears and attacks, but just through at, at extra arm's length so that it can't be in any way traced back to the church. And so this is a way to resurrect and resuscitate Fair, Fair Mormon's reputation and just to find some other way to do the smearing. Um, you know, that's a, that's a question that I have because I would love to make sure I'm, I'm never smearing people and that I never get smeared because it, it, it does damage to me and my family and to the cause when, when this smearing type of stuff happens. And frankly, if the church funded Quaku and Cardin, gave them money, paid for their equipment, paid them money to do this work, and then Quaku and Cardin just continue their YouTube channels and podcasts doing the smearing. Well, now all the church did was launch some, some smearing vehicles that they can now say they've washed their hands of, but in effect, they still created the, the smearing monsters. So these are the types of things I'm just wondering if Quaku and Cardin are, or some other iteration are gonna reemerge and just keep continue the smearing secretly supported by the church or its wealthy members just without uh the fingerprints of the church and that's why i i named it uh partially fair mormon partially repents douglas you're nodding your head yeah what is it that resonates with you or what 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 thoughts do you have around this idea of partial repenting well yeah for, for me 
repenting means owning what you did and um and like kind of anthony said at the beginning that for some it means leaving it as as a public record there's been a lot of debate around in in the uk around statues and the meaning of statues and i don't know if that's been going on in the states as well i think it has about do we leave statues up because of what they represent and because of who they seem to glorify do we tear them down and erase them from history or do we leave them up to remind us of what happened and and how we shouldn't repeat it and that, that there can be the question asked of whether we should do that with these fair mormon videos it seems that fair mormon are very um very keen to eradicate these entirely um uh, i hope you don't mind me bringing this up but uh i i mentioned to you earlier that i woke up to an email this morning my time um of two copyright strikes um that have been delivered to me from youtube by fair mormon um where they had complained that my videos were in breach of copyright and tried to have my videos removed now youtube stood up for me and said no no we're um you know th these are fair use my videos are approximately double the length of the original videos so there's at least as much content again that is mine in commentary um so they're perfectly within the realms of the law but but twice fair mormon tried to use the law to silence my videos and, and get rid of them at, because they are effectively now uh, along with a couple of other videos from some other users all that remains on youtube as evidence of what happened and so we have to ask is it repenting to try and hide your mistakes or is it repenting to say yeah we did it let's let's leave it there let's let's put a thing in the comments saying we we no longer agree with this or we we no longer uh, condone this kind of action or whatever but I feel like you have, if you're going to really own it, if you're going to really repent and build and learn, you have to leave it there and say, yeah, this is this, that, this happened. And um, we learned from it and we've moved on, but it did happen. Yeah. And I would just say that if, if Cardin and Kwaku and Kate Kelly or whatever start coming out with more smearing content, one thing the church can do is shut that down. They can mm -hmm. tell Kwaku, they can tell, and some say that Kwaku is just waiting until he graduates from BYU to, to unleash stuff that maybe his continuing status at BYU was being threatened, and so he needed to graduate before he could start up doing this again. But all I can say is if Cardin and Kwaku are members of the church, um, if the violence and if the ad hominem and if the smears reemerge, certainly the Mormon church can shut that down through the, the ways that it has power and influence. And I hope that the church would do that. Anthony, what are your thoughts on this idea of partial repentance? Well, I, I certainly think that they would be reluctant to issue an apology uh, for concern that you'd spike the football and so would Jeremy. Um, but Jeremy's response and, and our discussion today was going to happen regardless of whether uh, they acknowledged or apologized uh, for those videos. Um, I, th I think that's probably the motivation for not specifically doing an apology. Um, I, I think that... Don't, don't you think that's general policy, regardless of me and Jeremy or anything we might or might not do? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the church's policy is you never apologize. Uh, I don't know. Has has Fair Mormon ever apologized for anything it's done? I, I, I don't I don't think... I don't recall that they've ever apologized. They I just, can't. I can't note the irony that apologists probably don't apologize. Apologize, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, things just go down the memory hole, right? Yeah. Um, so um, I see. I think that that's uh, one part of it is they don't want you to spike uh, the football, and they don't want to set a precedent where they need to apologize for every other things. They're just going to let it. Uh, go down the memory hole. I think I think those are pri primarily the reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, so yeah. Now they've made this change, and uh, and again, Douglas, I I am sad when I learned that they're trying to shut you down, because what's ironic is, well, number one, the the Quaku videos have been taken down, but of course, ex Mormon Reddit is wise enough to to download those and and preserve them. So they're gonna be preserved and made available however tech people make uh, copyrighted material available these days. But also they're living on in the response videos. And I was sad to see, as you mentioned, Douglas, that, that they're trying to shut down and, and 
make copyright strikes against the response videos because it's a little bit uh, probably frustrating for them that they're going to shut down their videos, but that the response videos, which are probably more embarrassing and damaging, are going to live on. <laughs> so I yeah, you know, the, I the tone know. of his complaint was very frustrated. He was very much, "This is not legal. I'm not happy about this." And YouTube said. Sorry, we're we're concerned that this doesn't meet the requirements to remove it, so it's staying up. And I think that does beg the question of repentance. If if you are truly sorry for what you've done, you don't try and hide hide the sin and bury the evidence. You mm. just sort of say, "Yeah, I did that, and I feel bad, and I'm sorry." Yeah, and and that's what we get. That's what we get for for acting in that way. For doing it, yeah. Anything you want to add to that, Anthony? Yeah, I mean. Uh, having spoken with people uh, a little bit on the inside or that are familiar with what happens on the inside, the, the Strengthening Church uh, Members Committee um, includes, there's a division uh, where they hire mostly younger people to follow what you do, and probably now Nemo probably has a couple people following him uh, to follow what uh, Bill Real, RFM, Bill Real, RFM Al Alan and Katie Mount, Mike Norm, Mike Norton. So, so they have people who they hire. May maybe they're college students, maybe they're recent grads that follow what we do and then do reports um, because the church wants to try to anticipate what we're going to do next. I mean. Probably the biggest example was they wanted to anticipate what Mike Norton was going to do next. Was he going to release a video of Mitt Romney in the temple? Was he going to get a recording of the uh, second anointing? Was he going to, you know, he made a joke threatening to, to film sexually explicit things in a temple um, at one point uh, that some people actually believed that it was more than a joke. So, um, so the, so the church has these people that follow us. I mean, there's sometimes, I don't know, maybe this is a conspiracy, but sometimes I'll share stuff on Facebook and I'll, I'll, I'll share a post, I'll, I'll write a post and it'll get shared in two or three places that I can't see where it was shared. Um, and I've asked people, you know, who I think might know uh, where those things get shared and nobody's been able to tell me where those things get shared. So my, I suspect that because I participate in episodes with Mormon stories, because of the things that I do, maybe I got one of those people that follows me. But I know that there are people that follow you, John. I know that there are people that follow Bill Rill and and Mike Norton and others. And and so my, my take is, the reason I bring this up is, my my guess is uh, that people at Fair Mormon certainly have watched all the all of Doug's Douglas's videos, um, and maybe in the Strengthening Church Members Committee uh, structure, there are now people there that are following your videos and that do reports on them as well, and and that is what precipitated uh, Fair Mormon requesting uh, a, a takedown uh, copyright infringement with YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, I have waved to them in videos. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've given a cheeky wave to the Strengthening Church Members Committee in, in videos in past. <laughs> I love it. Um, ja Jackson Washburn is uh, in the house. He says, Anthony, I, I routinely have the odd sharing phenomena as well. I never know where they are shared to. Um, so yeah, I mean, and you, this is just how Scientology works. It's how the Jehovah's Witnesses work. Any high demand religion, uh, emerging religion, uh, it's 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 a it's disparaging to call any organization a cult uh, these days. But any of these types of organizations have uh, the equivalent of a KGB or a CIA or a M two or whatever they're called that have intelligence uh organizations that are continually gathering information uh even in private uh secret ways so and, the and feeding that back so the interesting 
inside information is while Jackson and I and you and others might have people who for some period of time follow us to try to an anticipate what we're going to do um, and what the impacts are going to be. Um, the other part of the inside information is um, for those people that they hire to follow you, John, um, they have turnover because sometimes following your material ends up lead, leading them into a faith crisis. Um, and so um, that's some other inside information that, that, that's kind of interesting that they hire people to follow all of us. And, and some of the sacrificial lambs essentially are those people who they hire to follow us who end up in a faith transition because they follow us. Yeah, it's, it's got to be tricky for the church to maintain people these days because so many people are leaving and so many problems are so well known. You got to pay people an awful lot of money uh, to not defect. And how do you guarantee that they're going to want to do this type of intelligence gathering over a long period of time without their conscience starting to really uh, peck at them and without, frankly, them just feeling like they've sold their soul to the devil, so to speak? Um, it's got to be really hard. So I, I just want to um, end, end where I began and say, congratulations, Mormon Church. Congratulations, fair Mormon, now fair Latter-day Saints. Um, oh, you know, I want to end, I want to, I want to talk about this one last thing. You know, people have been really hard on Quaku. They've been really hard on Cardinellis. They've been really hard on Bradley Whitbeck. And in the past, they've been hard on John Gee and, and Daniel Peterson. Um, and others like them. And I want to I want to just speak directly to Kwaku and Cardin and others and, and John Gee and everyone and just say, um, I, I feel sorry for the situation you have been put in. And I think it's the church's responsibility. Here's what I mean by this. One of the things I learned from my interview with Sandra Tanner when we talked about people like Steve Christensen, who ultimately lost his life, but all the other people that the that the Mormon Church used in the Hoffman uh, sort of scandal to be buyers for the church in their documents, and the way that the church uses its members, its faithful members, as human shields, so that the church can have plausible deniability, so the church doesn't have legal or financial. Um, responsibility, but but so the church can have its dealings done. In other words, you know, having members buy the documents and then donate them to the church so the church can't be accused of buying and hiding the documents. This is something, the types of things that the church has been doing for decades, for over a century. Same thing with apologetics. What the church does is it it it, it either hires you know, Daniel Peterson or John Gee to do the apologetics, or the church asks wealthy donors to start nonprofits that then uh, hire people or even volunteers emerge to do the, the dirty work for the church um, through these nonprofits, sometimes funded through shadow money. And ultimately what always happens is these human shields become the collateral damage or become the carnage. And, you know, Daniel Peterson's academic reputation is pretty much worthless at this point. John Gee's is pretty much worthless. Hugh Nibley, you know, um, Hugh Nibley's was pretty worthless. Uh, you know, Br Brian Hauglid, Carrie Milstein, not, not Brian Hauglid, Carrie M M Milstein and others, you know, all, all these apologet apologists at some point become social carnage as they become laughingstocks. And then they're kind of put off to pasture and then a new crop emerges. And I just want to express my sadness for people like Cardinellis, for people like Bradley Whitbeck, for people like Kwaku, because, you know, they had their, their 15 minutes of fame. Maybe it's not over yet. Maybe they're still going to try and be a part of this conversation. But what almost always certainly happens is at some point, they become mercilessly mocked, criticized, beaten down. They become a footnote, in, a laughingstock footnote in the history of the church. And it, just like sort of, you know, um, you know, 
bombers in a jihad, they're simply just replaced with more human shields and with more bombers. And they're the collateral damage. And the church sort of always emerges, you know, hands apparently clean, arms length, relatively unscathed um, it, it, for the, all this dirty work that goes on. And so I actually don't like it when people are mean spirited to Kwaku or Cardin or Brad or others, because I see them as victims uh, when it really should be the church and it's, it's, it's first presidency, it's quorum of the 12, it's prophets, seers and revelators who are on the line doing the, the defending and not pushing off the dirty work through shadow funded nonprofits to human sh faithful human shields that become collateral damage and laughing stocks. And they really have their reputation smeared and ruined and they're kind of forgotten and put out to pasture. It, it, what do you think about what I'm saying, Douglas? And then Anthony, I'll have you speak as well. I think, I think you can take that analogy further. I think that's a very common MO in the church the members of the church are the collateral damage for the sustaining of the truth claims of the church it doesn't matter how untenable or how or how seriously rickety the logic and the reasoning is as long as it benefits most of the members and can continue with the narrative of keeping the church uh, as true and the truth claims of the church upheld then it doesn't matter that it's setting up most of the members for a fall. It doesn't matter that most of the members are building their faith on some weak foundations when if they were just exposed to the ability to talk about these things earlier on and to less controlled information and they were just allowed to learn more and more earlier on, people would have less faith crises and therefore less trust crises because ultimately I think a lot of people lose their trust in the church um, as well as their faith. So I think the church does that even on a broader scale, the local leadership are put up as sacrificial lambs when, you know, something goes on, someone like me appears in their ward and all of a sudden they're put in a really difficult position of being told by the top they've got to do something or feeling like they need to protect their members and not really being supported and they're just volunteers trying to do their best. The members of the church are wonderful people and I feel like they're given a raw deal a lot of the time because they're put in situations by the leadership of the church who are trying to uphold a narrative and a tradition that means that you get that sort of turnover and, and people leaving and people getting hurt all because, you know, they're just being set up because they don't matter as long as the truth claims carry forward. That's fine. Yeah. And the church has to be careful because RFM, who I think is one of the most formidable critics of the church right now, guess what? Former apologist, Bill Real, one of the most formidable critics of the church right now, guess what? Former member of Fair Mormon, former participant in Fair Mormon. Um, you know, if Brian Hoglid ever, you know, becomes more vocal, you know, he, he a, a former apologist could, could not be great for the church. David Bakavoy, uh, a once sort of semi-apologist in a sense for the church, not in any way like the others we've talking talked about, but he was with CES. Um, you know, nothing, you know, we talk about one of the biggest risks to Mormonism being defectors. When apologists start defecting, the church is going to really be in trouble. And we've had some of those in the past. Um, you could even say that I was kind of a semi-neo-apologist once upon a time. That's when things get really dangerous. Anthony, do you want to do you want to comment on this topic at all before we wrap up? Yeah, I mean, I I would push back on some of what you're saying. I I I don't I don't think it's a monolith of what exists in the top leadership in terms of this idea of we're going to use uh, pawns to do attacks and so forth, because they did you know, switch from farms to Maxwell Institute. And now Fair Mormon is switching to Fair. And I think there's, my view then is that that's evidence that there, there's not a consensus of agreement of how to deal with difficult information, that there are probably some that, you know, they feel empowered by the Hugh Nibley, Daniel Peterson kind of approach. And there are probably others that uh, have recognized that that's not un, that's not helpful, and and they've kind of gone the different direction. I, I do ag agree that for many years it seems very clear 
that the belief among the leadership was that a Hugh Nibley uh, uh, old farms approach was the preferred approach. Approach, but I, I, I think I think there's probably disagreement in there. I would also say that you know when you talk of Gee or Peterson or or some of the others. I mean, there's there's still a lot of people that really put a lot of credence in their work, even still. I mean, even after Guy did that book, uh, that he had this horrific chapter or pa set of passages about, you know, what makes a person gay. It's because they were sexually abused or something like that, and, and that book was uh, taken out of publication because of that in spite of those kinds of things, in spite of the other kinds of things that RFM has done with regard to Guy's work, as, as well as the stuff that you covered in, in the series with Robert Whit Rittner, um, there's still a lot of people that put a lot of cred credence in him as well. So they, they, I, I, think, I think as Peter uh, Bleakley, if I'm saying Peter's name right, you know, has this podcast series that he's uploaded onto YouTube uh, about the Mormon Civil War. And, you know, he, he talks about some of these things that I, I think there, there's quite, there's probably disagreement as to the tone and so forth. So in any event, that's a little bit of my pushback. I agree with what you're saying, but I think that there's probably an increasing number uh, among the top leadership that recognize that that, that approach is not helpful. What about the question of collateral damage? Because that was my main point. My main point wasn't so much the conspiracy coordination. Yeah. Yeah. I'm talking about the collateral damage of the reputation and and the just the public perception of so many of these people. Yeah, I mean, I mean, my interactions with Kwaku uh, and friends that have had uh, uh, interactions with not Cardin but Brett well, Brad, maybe, in any event, is uh, I, I really uh, accept that Kwaku really believes what he was doing was the right thing. And I think that he really believes uh, that if there's any blowback, that it, it was totally worth it because he really believes that it was the right thing to do. Um, you know, when we had our episode and we talked about apologetics, I started out by explaining that I think the majority, uh, if not almost all of apologists, during the time that they're doing their apologetics, they generally hold a strong belief that they're doing what God would have them do. And I think that is absolutely the case for Kwaku, you know, uh, I, I think it's absolutely the case. Um, when when Brad and Cardin and Kwaku uh, talked about you know, really horrific things that are not true about you and Jeremy. Um, you know, maybe they were embellishing, but I think Kwaku really believes that you're evil. Like that if you had the chance to do something evil, um, that you would do it. I think that he really believes that. And I think that's what motivates him. So yes, I think they're collateral damage, but I don't think that they actually, if they're still believing, I don't think that they regret that at all because they really believe. You're saying it's kind of, it's kind of willing, they're willing collateral damage. They're, they're kind of jihadists that are okay dying on the sword, so to speak. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they're true believers. They, they're, they're true believers. They're in the fight for what they believe that God would have them do. And uh, it, if they end up with blowback, they believe that that's a sacrifice that they needed to make for God. They don't. They don't see it as a political, organizational, institutional evolution kind of thing. They really believe it. Yeah. All right. Well, I think it's time to wrap up. So uh, I just want to. I just want to plug a couple things. I want to plug the CES letter debunkings fair mormon dash fair dash tits that's jeremy runnell's response to fair mormon please check that out please support jeremy i also want to plug nemo's channel um if you go to youtube and you type in nemo mormon or whatever you'll find nemo's channel this is douglas's channel and of course i want to plug unpacking ambiguity 
uh, com.wordpress.com, uh, which is Anthony's blog. Uh, but let me just uh, give each of you a chance to kind of give your, your closing statement. Why don't we start with you, Douglas? Sure. Um, <clears throat> for me, this has been, it's been a really interesting experience. Kind of this is my first foray into, into this world. I'm still very new to this. Um, and my hope is still that I can do some good in my in my journey and in my own faith crisis. I can do some good and help others. I can interact with the church in a positive way. And I'm really grateful that we've had a positive tone to this discussion in a lot of ways. That we've we've commended the good things that have happened and that we've we've recognised the progress that can be had and will kind of still be had in the future. Um, other than that, I think my only other thing would be to admonish anyone that really cares about anything I have to say, to be kind in your online discussions, to uh, not resort to ad hominem attacks, to really think about what the other person is saying, hear them, then respond, and and just be kind in your in your discussions with other people because you, if you are someone that's moved on from the church, you were in the position that someone else that's kind of maybe on the other side of it now was in, you know, you, you, you weren't that, you were that person not too long ago. And I think we all need to remember that sometimes um, and just keep level-headed, stick to the facts uh, and that will make things a lot more fruitful. And hopefully this is the end of, of those sorts of tactics out of Fair Mormon. Amen. And out of uh, other faithful yeah. Mormons, not just mm -hmm. fair Mormon, because Indeed. if if we just do a shell game of who the new attackers are, we're not yeah. really accomplishing anything. I just don't mm -hmm. think it's consistent with Christianity to be smearing people and attacking people. I just I just don't think that's Christ-like. Anthony, what's your final word? Yeah, I, I, I think this whole last uh, several months has been very interesting. Um, I, I've been uh, really pleased to see people like Jackson Washburn and Jim Bennett and others, you know, step up to the plate and, and be clear that they don't support that kind of apologetics. They didn't support the Quaku videos. Um, and and Jackson and others went so far as to criticize, you know, the COVID parties that Kwaku did uh, last summer. But I think it's really cool that um, there are people who I would say are inside the edge of Mormonism. Maybe they're further inside the edge than others, uh, or maybe they're closer to the edge than others. But I think it's been really cool to see several of those people step up to the plate and and uh, call a spade a spade in terms of uh, uh, personal attacks, of threats of violence, of glorification of the kinds of things that showed up uh, in these mocking videos. I, I just think it's really cool to see these people step up to the plate. And uh, I, I think this whole experience will all be a little bit better for it. Um, and uh, in any event, that's what I wanted to share. And I'm grateful for the opportunity uh, to participate today. All right. Thanks to everyone. Uh, thanks to Douglas and Anthony. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks to all our listeners. We had over 600 viewers live. Super grateful for the support. I just want to say uh, again, thank you, Mormon Church, for making a good decision. Thank you, Fair Mormon, for making a good decision. Thank you, Scott Gordon. Thank you, John Lynch, for making good decisions. And I want to just say, I wish Quaku and Cardin Ellis and Bradley Whitbeck, I wish you well. Um, I hope you guys are able to find healthy, constructive ways to engage in this conversation. And I, I am also going to say that I have been critical or even mean spirited of people in the past. And I want to do, take this opportunity to be introspective about what I do and about what I do going forward and try and be, you know, not, that doesn't mean we can't be thoughtful or even critical, but I want to do it in kind or respectful ways. And I'm going to mess up again, but I am, I am publicly committing to do my best to try and, and be as kind and thoughtful and as, and as loving as I can. So thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us again. Thanks Douglas and Anthony. Thanks Thank to you. all our listeners. And we'll see you guys all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Take care, Take everybody. Care. Thanks.